will introduce um, James Hitchcock, who is today's IE seminar speaker. Um, James is a postdoctoral research fellow within the Centre for Applied Water Science here at University of Canberra, uh, where he uh, is one of the research fellows on the Flowmer Basin Scale project, which seeks to assess the Modelling Basin Scale responses to uh, environmental watering. Um, James has had a diverse career to date for one so young. Uh, he uh, has worked uh, in various roles within the university sector as a researcher, uh, as a teaching academic, and he's also worked in the public sector for the New South Wales government. Um, originally, his PhD was from the University of Technology in Sydney, and he has wide ranging interests across uh, food web ecology, pollutant ecology, Many of you will have seen his um, three minute thesis talk recently on microplastics. Uh, and so he has a really diverse set of interests around the way in which um, human activities uh, impact upon um, food web structure and components. So it's a great pleasure to have James speaking to us today and um, I'll leave you to share your screen, James, and take it from here. All right, I think I've shared. Um, thanks very much um, for the kind introduction, Ross. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about the work that I've been doing over the last sort of year and a half, so starting um, at UC, um, working um, on this big FLOMA project. Um, FLOMA project is funded by um, the Australian government for the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. Um, and it's been a really interesting um, and rewarding um, and at times big and daunting um, project to work in, getting to work with um, all sorts of diverse um, people from diverse disciplinary um, backgrounds within a river science um, and ecology um, and all at distance largely. Um, but um, I guess starting off that I'm talking, it's, all those names there, and, and there's more that I haven't included. There are people who've contributed in different ways as, as co-authors um, and, and more broadly, sort of intellectually to different parts of, of some of the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, but my interest is in, in food webs, um, and I'm, I've always been interested in food webs, um, I guess, as a way to see and understand ecosystems. Um, and so why should, we, why should we care about food webs and why should we care about thinking um, about ecosystems um, using food webs as a sort of conceptual framework? Well, they're really it's a useful framework for understanding both um, you know, the assemblage of taxa um, as well as well, food webs are largely about the assemblage of different taxa and how energy moves between them. So in this way, it sort of integrates some of the concepts that we talk about in, a, in community ecology um, as well as a lot of the work that we do traditionally in the ecosystem science. So which critters are where and looking at measurements for how things like carbon and nutrients flow between these different um, individual taxa or groups and compartments. Um, some interesting, important things to think about when thinking about food webs is that they're size structured. Um, and so this helps, so there's like really big, iconic, interesting species. Um, things like Murray cod, um, golden perch, and these aquatic food webs, birds, you know, occasionally water rats, these sorts of things. There's also lots of really small things. And actually the majority of life, majority of life on earth, when we're talking about food webs, um, is these microscopic things, these things that we sort of can't see when we're walking around in the world, uh, which make understanding food webs um, complex and a hard thing to do. Um, and as many of, or as much as there are or this huge um, amount of little critters, there's this huge amount of interactions happening at that microscopic scale. It's important to keep in mind when we're talking about food webs and things going on in food webs, that a lot of that stuff um, requires microscopes to see, um, and it is hard to do. Food webs are really complex. They're complex spatially. Um, we have, you know, many animals that can travel between ecosystems. Birds can fly between rivers and wetlands. Fish can travel across up and down river ecosystems. Um, and of course, in, in rivers themselves, most animals um, travel downstream. Um, we also have complex um, 
temporal dynamics, we've got um, things like microbes that might only live a few days or a few hours to complete their life cycle. And we have animals like Murray cod that can live 100 years. Um, and the kinds of environmental factors that are impacting them across their lifespan so vary greatly. Um, how will those things interact and come and, and influence the way um, energy moves between all these critters um, is incredibly interesting and, and also incredibly difficult to do. Um, humans are part of food webs, of course, and it's important um, I, we haven't included humans there, also haven't included different, all sorts of little critters there. It's a, a sort of conceptual indicative idea of food webs. So if your favorite nematode is there, not there or something, don't, don't worry too much. But humans are part of food webs, of course we eat um, fish, we're, we're involved in these food webs in, in those sorts of ways. Um, but we also indirectly rely on the functioning of food webs really heavily. So things like carbon and nutrient cycling, water quality. Um, and of course, you know, thinking about how much we rely on food webs in the last few weeks, um, carbon cycling is hugely important. Um, you know, primary producers drawing carbon out of the atmosphere, storing it away in sort of complex, um, complex compounds, which can't be accessed that easily. And of course, ecosystems, our food webs and aquatic ecosystems particularly are, are under stress uh, and from the things that we're doing to them. The Murray-Darling Basin, that's largely about interrupting hydrology. Um, on the left there is an image of the water storages in the basin. Sort of every major river system along the Great Dividing Range now has you know, at least one, often multiple, very large water storages. The total amount of water that is stored or can be stored um, in dams, in these large dams, uh, is greater than the average um, flow in the river in any year. So it's a huge amount of water and a huge amount of change that we're doing to river systems. And of course, those changes come out in different ways when we start to think about the industries like agriculture and the, the more uh, varied impacts they are having both on the drawing, water from rivers and ecosystems and also changing um, landscapes. And so how is that you know, more broadly affected hydrology and, and flow regimes? Well, this image just sort of shows you a, a quick overview of how impacted, um, hydro, how impacted hydro, hydrologic regimes um, are in Australia. So the green is good. We haven't changed too much of the flow in the desert in Australia. Um, there's not much to change. Um, or increasing, I suppose there is when we think about the um, groundwater. But those, those red places indicate how you know, drastic big changes to flow regimes in Australia. And of course, you can see the Murray Darling Basin there, um, big in red. These sorts of changes that we've made to hydraulic systems in particular have led to massive um, changes in the biodiversity and tax present globally in freshwater systems. Um, and freshwater ecosystems are perhaps impacted um, more than many other ecosystems um, when we're thinking about the number of species that have gone extinct and the number of species that are endangered in these systems. So why are environmental flows important? Um, is thinking about environmental flows. There's lots of different kinds of environmental flows. Um, there's types of planned environmental flows, so rules that might restrict access, um, maybe during high flows or during low flows. These are embedded in management plans. And then there's um, the kind of environmental water that we largely deal with in FOMA, which is held environmental water in dams, you know, water that's held by the Commonwealth government. Um, and so, there's a diverse sort of range of things we try to do with environmental water. Um, importantly, we, you know, we create and connect habitat so we can deliver environmental water um, onto dry uh, wetlands. We can connect backwaters with the main channel. Um, these things help sustain plants to grow. Um, we also can move sediment. These things also move sediment around. So creating sort of different types of micro habitats and sustaining different types of smaller habitats throughout these river ecosystems. Flows also deliver really important resources. So things like organic matter, things like nutrients. And these are the critical sort of basal, uh, basal nutrients that are needed to sustain life in these systems. Um, and these nutrients are largely delivered, of course, from upstream to downstream in these systems. 
Um, and as we get lower down into lowland systems, we start to um, be introduced laterally from um, floodplains and, and stuff that is out of soils. Um, and so these flows can be really important for sustaining and promoting energy production. Um, and whilst a lot of environmental flows are often targeted around getting water onto wetland to keep plants alive, or perhaps particular life history cues for iconic species such as fish and movement or spawning, um, we're also doing stuff, we're also changing energy production and increasingly environmental flows are targeted at creating sort of productivity and productivity flows. So thinking about not just um, more sort of clear cut things such as triggering spawning of fish or making sure um, you know, a ecological community in a wetland the plants could grow, but these more complex sort of functional types of things in ecosystems. And so that leaves us with these sort of two questions that we're really thinking about in our work on food webs, which is, you know, what are the effects of, of hydrology on productivity more broadly? And how do changes in hydrology influence sort of the flow of energy in food webs and ecosystems. So this is a, a little video of a large flood that happened on the Barwon Barling um, back in April this year. And you know, one thing looking at this water that should become obvious is there's huge, huge amounts of organic matter um, being mobilized and transported during these floods. So these systems, of course, are brown. These rivers are fairly brown anyway, but they're extra brown at these moments. And there's you know, huge amounts of particulate organic matter. There's big debates in the literature around the role of this um, sort of terrestrial organic matter. It's often thought not to be particularly useful in food works because this is all sort of old decayed material, often made of really complex types of compounds. So these big sort of um, geomic pulvic acid sorts of things that make the water really brown. They're hard to break down and digest. And for them to enter food webs, there's lots of steps that have to go, they have to go through for this dissolved uh, compound to get to things like fish. But during these big times that we have flood and flow events, kind of organic matter entering these systems is potentially different because the flow paths of water are potentially different. They're not coming from deep down in groundwater they're suddenly um, coming across surface soil horizons, collecting material, and that material is potentially quite different. So this first study is looking at how these big floods and these big flows might influence the bioavailability of carbon. So bioavailability being how much of that carbon um, is eaten, is utilized by the food web. So our main question, is thinking about, well, how does bioavailability of organic carbon change during these big flood events? And so the secondary question is thinking about, well, how do nutrient concentrations influence carbon availability? Is that something we have to think about as well? Um, and what kind are, are, are these, there are differences between water sources and are some water sources um, important when we're thinking about managing rivers um, more so than others? Uh, talking about these sorts of basal resource inputs to big rivers. Um, so to do this, uh, sort of a bioavailability assay study across four weeks um, out here on the Barwon River. So these assays um, are really simple. They consist of small bottles. Uh, we collect water from the river. We filter it. Um, here down to sort of one micron. So we're excluding most things except bacteria, and hopefully excluding most of the things that might prey on bacteria. Um, and keeping them sort of in the dark so there's no product reduction um, and a constant temperature. Um, in the study, we had free bottles that were just water collected. We also had a treatment where we added additional nutrients to sort of account for potential nutrient limitation that might happen for the microbes in those um, containers. And of course, here we're calculating the bioavailable carbon as the amount of dissolved carbon that gets utilized across these four weeks. Um, and so on the right at the top there is a, a graph of discharge in the system at one of the sites um, and showing this really large flood, flood peak and when those sampling dates happened. Um, and down here is the, the sites that we sampled. So um, this is part of a, a 
sort of uh, this project, I guess, was opportunistic study as part of another project that I was involved with, uh, looking at the role of these tributaries. But here, the, the study that we've done here has collected water from these six sites. So we can also assess not just what is happening in the Bar and Darling, but the potential contributions um, from the Mehai River, which is draining out of the, the wider, wider uh, water resource plant area, and, and of course, the Namway River down here. So the results. So sort of as you might expect, the concentrations of dissolved organic carbon um, go up or higher sort of during and following um, this flood, and because this is concentrations per litre, um, and if we were to sort of times this to create a load, we're talking huge, um, huge amounts of organic carbon flowing through these systems. Um, so I'm just giving you this one example of this one site, the lowest site here on the bar, which is downstream of Namoy. Um, so this is in Walgut, the bridge, um, the southern bridge, I guess, um, in, in Walgut. And this is the, the results from the, the bioavailability. So uh, our four study dates here, the light bars are, are sort of controls, so we haven't added anything, and, and the dark bars show um, where we've added nitrogen and phosphorus, so we're sort of eliminating nutrient limitation. And on the left is the percentage of the carbon that was used. And so we see a fairly clear pattern that that carbon that comes in during the peak of this flood is more bioavailable than the carbon that is entering once we return to lower flows. Um, important as to point out that we're still talking about a small amount of this carbon. Um, you know, at max, we're talking around 30% of this carbon can be utilized during these peaks. It still leaves a large amount um, of carbon, 70%, more than half, obviously, that um, is refractory, essentially, is not being utilized quickly within four weeks in these food webs. Um, the other thing you'll, and this, this pattern is, is similar across all sites. The other thing you'll um, notice here and pick up is um, that we're seeing examples of nutrient limitation. So we are seeing uh, times when the amount of carbon that is utilized is higher when it adds nutrients. Um, so there's potential nutrient limitation here. And the reason I guess we're thinking about nutrient limitation is um, we're doing these things in bottles, things change. There's, uh, microbes have access to nutrients that are cycling. So this might give us a better idea of what is actually being utilized out there in, in recent systems. And also can help us think about what happens when we're looking at a system that has much higher nutrients versus much lower nutrients. Um, so these are nutrient results. I haven't analyzed all of this, this data um, too closely yet. Um, so it's just a cursory overview, but um, what becomes sort of fairly clear is that we see not too much nutrient limitation early on in these experiments. It's, it's a smaller amount. Um, during these times, we have fairly low levels of nitrogen, um, but fairly high levels of phosphorus. So when we're getting lots of phosphorus in the system, that nutrient limitation doesn't seem to be huge. But as that progresses back to low flows, pretty much high levels of nitrates, some available um, nitrogen, lower levels of um, of reactive phosphorus, which is the available phosphorus. So that's so potentially indicating that phosphorus might be the main thing that's limiting um, carbon take up here in these systems. Um, and that you know, generally makes sense because um, you know, bacteria have a fairly high um, demand for phosphorus um, during growth. Um, Third question we're thinking about was the contributions. Um, so I've only done a very cursory look at this so far, but you know, we can see we have different amounts of carbon coming in during different times. Um, so up, this is uh, upstream from the Barwon, upstream of the Namoy, Namoy itself, and downstream of the Namoy. Um, and so this is the change here in the uh, sort of colored infield bar. Um, is the amount of water. So this includes the water that's coming in from the Namoy as well as the water flowing down the Barwon. And this is how it's sort of, you can start to understand how this is changing the nature. These inputs from these tri tributaries are changing the nature of um, the carbon and carbon cycling in these systems. Um, so I haven't calculated loads and all, all of this work yet. This just gives you a bit of an indication from this broader report of the kind of things you might be looking at. So 
from the top site um, here above the Mihai to the bottom site below the Namoi, we can see there's a large amount of water coming in from these tributaries during the peak of flow. Um, and so this accounts for um, you know, up to 60, 70% of the water flowing through the Barwon during some of these floods is actually coming from the Namoi, coming from the Mihai. Um, so it starts to give you an, an indication of how important particular flow rules might be um, in these systems. So end of, end of system flow rules coming out of these rivers, water shepherding potentially going through the Barwon Darling, Barwon Darling, and of course restrictions on, on pumping out water during these high flows. So think about our questions, bioavailability is higher during the peak of these flows. You see the nutrients can limit um, uptake and tributaries, you know, potentially contributing large amounts during peaks. Um, but uh, I guess the next step then is thinking about, well, we're getting all these inputs. How is that changing our base, the, the critters that are doing uh, um, production at the base of the food chain? So our microbes, um, and our uh, phytoplankton. So of course the classical food web um, really focuses on phytoplankton, phytoplankton here um, as our sort of primary, um, uh, primary pathway of energy. And then the microbial loop here of all these sort of complex interactions and connections, potentially adding sort of bonus supplementary um, pathway for energy and food webs. But how do these sorts of things change? Um, these pathways change when you get big resource pulses and other particular critters um, that are important, uh, uh, um, important to think about when we're thinking about how energy flows through these systems. Um, so in this second study, we're interested in you know, how organic matter introduces basal resource production and pathways of production, and if these resource pulses, how they might be altering uh, the community structure of phytoplankton. And is that something we need to think about when we're planning and thinking about sort of modeling environmental flows? Um, so we conducted um, these microcosm experiments in five five meter enclosures. And this work was conducted out here on, on the Lachlan, so upstream of the Lubula near Gulagong. Um, and this work was led by Matt Olza, who's a PhD student that I was supervising um, at UTS when I uh, arrived at UC. And this was, he needed an extra um, uh, study to complete his uh, PhD thesis. And so this was one of the, this, the sort of study we came up with, thinking about how the structure of phytoplankton communities um, change during resource pulses. Um, so in this study, we have treatments, control, we, added carbon in low and high amounts, we added nutrients, and then we added both the combination of those simple sort of factual design. I'm interested in then looking at the differences between heterotrophic pathways, so bacterial abundance, um, and autotrophic pathways, chlorophyll A, and the structure of that, that community. Um, so talk through these results. So on the left is a graph showing bacterial abundance in these different enclosures over time. Um, so these high numbers here, really high numbers of bacteria cells, bacterial abundance are occurring in our enclosures, or in our mesoc in our microcosms, where we're adding high levels of carbon and nutrients and low levels of carbon and nutrients. And these are both significantly higher, significantly higher bacterial production, and then we add only carbon down here. So we're seeing co-limitation of these bacteria. Um, but still, but even in these enclosures, I suppose these uh, microcosms where we're adding levels, where we're adding carbon by itself, those ones are higher than our controls. Um, so big, big pulses of um, bacterial production, big responses from our heterotrophs when we add these big pulses of organic matter. Interestingly, I guess here on the right is our chlorophyll A, so giving us an indication of our autotrophic pathways. And these show results that, um, and so these three that have responded here increases by day three of chlorophyll A are in the enclosures of adding nutrients. So nutrients by themselves, of course, leads to increased amounts of phytoplankton, um, but adding nutrients as well as carbon, we're seeing both responses of bacteria 
and our auditories. So it's important then to think about when we're getting these big pulses, that there's potentially enough nutrients available in our river systems to have both a heterotrophic response in the short term and then an autotrophic response a few days later. Um, so we're not talking about one or the other necessarily. Um, and just sort of quickly, some secondary other results. Down here, we're looking at the chlorophyll, these dark circles um, are the controls and the ones underneath them, which were significantly lower, are they've added carbon by themselves. So when there is very small amounts of nutrients available, um, we are seeing competition for nutrients potentially with bacteria. So bacteria potentially outcompeting um, phytoplankton for those available nutrients and reducing their production. Um, and there's also, I guess, thirdly, one of the interesting parts of these results is here towards the end of the experiment, we see another boom in bacteria. And these, this is in our treatments where we added only nutrients. So what I think is going on here is we have this big increase of phytoplankton, these phytoplankton die off, they release uh, oxidates, exudates um, um, as they die, and those organic that organic material then is used by bacteria to grow. And that's a kind of thing we kind of relationship we typically see um, where we don't have um, a lot from those inputs coming in. Thinking then about the structure, we saw particular changes in the structure of phytoplankton community. And the big one was a big increase in mixotrophs in the enclosures where we added carbon and nutrients. Um, and a big boom in mixotrophs, particularly Trachlea monas and Krypton, 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 Krypton monas, Krypton monads, whatever the gentleman is called, or gentle flagellate. Um, and so these critters are mixotrophic in that they, they photosynthesize like owl cells do, but they're also phagotrophic, so they engulf bacterial cells. And so it's really interesting that we're seeing um, a response here that's neither autotrophic purely or heterotrophic purely from these organisms. Um, we also see then uh, a couple of days later, these mixotrophs are very small cells, 10, 20 microns big, um, they start going down whilst we're seeing ciliates, which are also typically um, heterotrophic or mixotrophic increase. So they're potentially eating these cells in a kind of succession. Um, and of course, the other response that happens here, um, where we have nutrients, but also where we have nutrients in carbon, um, is big increases in diatoms, so really fast growing small cells. And so this sort of collection of things is particularly interesting. When we go back to thinking about what happened during that big flood in the Barwon, in the Bar River, we see essentially the same pattern, the same response. Um, so A up here is the peak of the flood, just following the peak of the flood is B, and then going back to the low flow times is C and D. And these colors up here, the sort of greeny, greeny colors, of dinoflagellates, cryptonomads, and um, euglenas. And they're all potentially phagotrophic um, algae, so it can photosynthesize and eat bacteria. Um, and they're dominating big time when we see these big floods happening. As we return to lower flows, we see these fast growing diatoms take over. So interesting, we're seeing the succession both in experiments and, and uh, mostly in the river. Um, so do organic matter inputs alter basal resource production? Um, yes, they do, um, but not necessarily one or the other both pathways seem to respond quite clearly. And that's something to think about when we're conceptualizing rivers and responses to flows. Um, but there's also these times when we're seeing, you know, competition or, or sort of, you know, mutualism, commensalism around nutrient availability, um, which makes you know, thinking about these sorts of relationships a bit trickier. Um, and do the structure of phytoplankton change? Um, yes, we see a lot more mixotrophic species followed by sorts of su successional changes. So these are types of things you might want to think about representing when we're talking about and sort of modeling um, food webs for thinking of, for determining what kind of um, environmental flows might be important. So getting all this production happening at the base of the food chain and seeing other critters respond. How does this, um, is this energy sort of useful for hydrotrophic organisms such as fish? Um, so, Um, 
So particularly at larval fish are some of the main consumers of these um, little critters, microplankton, uh, in rivers. Uh, and these little pictures here are pictures of golden perch. So you can see how small they are just in this small little jar. Um, you know, nearly see-through little critters, they're still developing their eyes and their nervous systems. Um, and so we're releasing a lot of environmental water to help trigger spawning for different kinds of fish, fish and such as golden perch. Golden perch are typically a flow, flow spawner. There's examples of when they don't, but typically they will release their eggs in response to flow. Those eggs drift down river after a few days, they hatch into these little critters. And then they've got a few days of using the energy in their egg, 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 um, egg sacs before they've got to start exogenous feeding. So going around searching for food. And that can be really hard for these little guys. They're not fully developed, it's hard to see. And the mouths are only so small and that limits the amount and types of food they can eat. And so there's potentially a mismatch. And this is something that's been suggested by different flow managers that there's triggering spawning in fish, um, but they're not seeing this Follow through to recruitment. So fish turning from these little, little, little larvae into fish that are sort of juveniles and adults, a year old. And is this because we are not inundating floodplains and bringing in lots of nutrients, um, stimulating sort of primary production responses? And so this um, links into sort of this broader theory in ecology of, of mismatch. And so um, it's most common in marine systems thinking about when fish lay eggs and larvae hatch, those things need to time up with the spring sort of plankton blooms in, in temperate oceans. Um, and if they don't, and that's increasingly not happening because of climate change, you're seeing a mismatch. They've got lots of larvae hatching, um, but not enough food for them to eat because the um, responses from phytoplankton and zooplankton are happening at different times. And that's potentially something that could be happening in rivers. So in this first study, this is what we're looking at. So, Larval golden perch growth limited by the availability of zooplankton. And can organic matter pulses help relieve some of that limitation? Um, so to answer that, we did a short um, study in um, the glass house in the laboratory, an enclosure study. Um, I don't have many better photos of this. Um, this was done sort of over Christmas during lockdown last year, and I realized the only photos I had were sort of slightly crazed selfies, um, going a, a mad in isolation. Um, but in these closures, we use lake water from um, down the road, Ginodera. We filtered it to around 300 microns to remove some of these bigger cells that we know these small larval fish can't eat to help to remove predators. And then we had a treatment and we had a control um, where we uh, didn't add anything. And then a treatment where we added our organic matter solution. So a big, large dose initially, um, and then subsequently as well. We primed these enclosures for six days before we added the fish to help um, get that sort of successional response um, through the food chain that we've seen in those other studies. Um, which point I measured the zooplankton and then added sort of the equivalent golden perch larvae so there'd be just enough food for them starting off in the controls. Um, and that's from, uh, there's sorts of numbers estimated from a couple of different um, studies that have been done um, in hatchery sort of situations. And we're interested in the differences um, both in garden perch growth, but also sort of how that relates to zooplankton abundance or prey. Um, so these graphs here on the left show the dissolved organic carbon, which is indicative of the organic matter solution which we added. Um, and on the bottom is time. And that line down the middle there, you can see is sort of the priming period. So we've got these first six days where we've added this material before we've added the fish at that dotted line. So you can see much um, higher amounts of organic carbon in our treatments versus our control. Um, and here on the, on the right is chlorophyll A. So we see big drops in chlorophyll A, but not hugely significant differences um, between our control and treatment. So that's the sort of base or resource setting for this experiment. These two graphs show the zooplankton. So on the left is um, microzooplankton. So these are nopli, these are rotifers. Um, these critters are typically sort of 100 microns long up to two, three, 400 microns long. Um, and so that is the food range that Isle of Golden Fetch larvae can eat 
at around four days post hatch because of the size of their mouths. Um, and so big, big jumps in both of them, higher amounts of um, these critters uh, in the treatment versus the control. And on the right is our largest zooplankton. So there wasn't many of these because we excluded them at the start of the experiment, but obviously uh, anopoli, they grow, they hatch, they metamorphize, and they grow into these larger ones, which we see um, increasing in abundance throughout this study. Um, so that line there is indicative of how much food is estimated that they'd need. So how many of those critters are they gonna need to satiate themselves? And this is a fairly conservative estimate um, based on sort of how much food they're eating um, in laboratory studies where they can eat however much they want. And so on the right is our um, results of our fish. This is just standard length of the fish. Um, so then our control, you can see both, you can see by day four, both of the fish in our control and treatments are both um, growing in size um, slowly, but they're growing faster in the treatment. Um, continues to day seven, but by the end of the experiment, we see big differences. So essentially what's happening here in the control, these dark circles, is these fish are starving. They've eaten themselves out of house and home, or some of those larger zooplankton that have grown have also contributed to eating the food that they're interested in eating. Um, and there's no longer enough food for them and they're starting to metabolize their own bodies, their own proteins for, for energy to, to get by. Um, where we've added um, our organic matter solution for treatment and seen larger zooplankton responses, you don't quite see that. Um, and so by day 11, much bigger fish, but not quite as big as we still suspect. And there's more variation here in these fish. So some of them are starting to um, change from being this really sort of seafood larval fish to being a bit more developed, whereas other fish in there are also starting to look like they're starving a bit. Um, those results, I think, yeah. And so we also did isotopes um, in these results, um, looking at so looking at how the um, organic matter that we added might have entered the food chain and helped support these critters. On the left is particulate organic matter, and this is for um, a size fraction uh, between 50 microns and 250 microns. So that's you know, sort of in the size range we're, we're talking about that these critters might be eating. Um, and so the treatment is always much higher here than the control. And that points to the organic matter solution that we used, which was kangaroo grass, a C4 plant, which probably sits around somewhere like minus 16, 14, something in that range. Looking at our golden perch, we see differences, small differences in the fish um, at days, days four and 12. So it's indicative that some of this carbon is going into supporting these fish. So it might not be their main source of energy, but this little bit extra is potentially helping them get through this difficult period in their, their early life. Um, so sort of conclusions from this. So that yes, you know, golden perch obviously are limited, um, but this is kind of complex timing. It's kind of figuring out these ontogenetic shifts as their mouth open and they get bigger. It's tricky to do, especially when you think about plankton succession. Tricky to think about how those things relate to managing rivers and water. Um, and so can organic matter pulses release some of that limitation? Yes, um, in small, there's small differences. Um, and these micro zooplankton, if they're available in large numbers when these fish need them, they may aid growth and survival. So thinking back from these smaller experiments back to, to the bigger picture, um, there's a whole raft of different sort of concepts of how we might think about rivers and food webs operating in rivers. Um, they're largely, one of the key differences is around sources of energy. You know, classic river continuum concept highlights the importance of energy coming from upstream to downstream. The flood pulse concept talks about energy coming in off flood plans. Um, the river rain productivity model talks about the importance of um, production um, within the channels of phytoplankton that also stop growing on the edges of sides. Um, and there's lots of big debate around these sorts of ideas um, coming from different authors, depending on what kind of systems they're working in. So temperate systems in America and Australia the river system is really dominated by um, autotrophic carbon. You start to look at all the work that's happening in Nordic countries where there's lots of browning and leaching coming off permafrost and wooded areas. 
much more um, supported by um, those trees in those situations. Thinking sort of conceptually about this, I've tried not to get too bogged down in these big concepts, and sort of think more about um, how well, Tannen, Zapp, and colleagues sort of conceptualize these flows of energy as being purely about sort of trophic upsurge. So, um, purely thinking about the dose, the amount of carbon at the bottom of the food web, whether it's from phytoplankton or trees or whatever, is big enough. Can we map and model how that flows through the food web? And if there's enough of it, it's potentially supporting high traffic systems. Um, so in this last study here, it's this large mesocosm study that we've completed, trying to look more broadly at the food web, to thinking about how these big pulses of organic carbon may alter broadly the, more broadly the structure of food webs. Um, and if these, uh, these pulses of organic matter that we're seeing during floods can potentially help support these hydrotrophic organisms. Um, so we did this month-long study here in um, the mesocosm uh, we have, the ETY mesocosms um, on campus, these are large um, circular mesocosms. Um, myself and, and Darren went back and forth um, for a couple of days with this small tank of filling them all up with water um, from Lake Genadera. Uh, we added uh, lava golden perch again. And we had a similar simple design control um, and this is, which had no addition and a treatment which had organic matter a solution of kangaroo grass. We've got to figure out exactly um, how much we added in terms of loads. We added you know, a lot of this carbon in the first few days and taking it off. Um, and of course, what we're interested here is, is understanding these differences in the structure and abundance of critters here and also fish growth. Um, I'll show you just briefly what these sort of mesocosms look like. There's a little video of the paddles. This paddle is moving water around you know, fairly slowly um, in this system um, at all times. So it's trying to mimic that sort of slow meander you might see um, in a river system. Um, and this gives you an idea of what's going on under the water. So this is one of them that um, leaked and we didn't use. It gives you an idea of what it looks like if you're a little fish or a critter down here. So you can see all these zooplankton, um, big blooms of, of zooplankton in the early days of these sorts of experiments. Um, swimming around, you can see some of the structures we put in there for little fish to hide and, swim out and hide and hang out in. It's a wood that we can scrape um, our biofilms off, those sorts of things. Lots of little nooks and crannies, all sorts of detritus and stuff building up up in these um, enclosures. So the findings of this, well, in the first 10 days, we see this big microbial response, um, followed by the sort of ciliate response as well. So big increases here in our treatment versus our control, um, for bacterial abundance, as well as things um, like ciliates that are potentially eating bacteria and some of those other um, little protists um, there in the microbial loop. Um, so that's sort of what we expected based on these different um, uh, experiments that we've conducted in the literature. These responses in the early days of this experiment then resulted in subsequent increases in, in rotifers, which are these small little critters dominated by um, polyarthra here. As you can see, um, it's sort of a suspension feeder, swims around in the water column, uh, quite quickly escape predation, um, feeding on whatever it can get its hands on basically, the plankton cells. Uh, and also um, the cyclopoid capypods, um, mostly mesocyclops um, and others here in the early days of the experiment. So rotifers higher in the first two weeks um, and copepods higher in the first two weeks as well. So we're seeing some of that um, sort of hypothesized response of adding lots of basal resources and that's supporting this next step up in the food web for zooplankton. Then we start to see the secondary response going on in our enclosures. So uh, at day 10, we sort of stop adding this organic matter solution. But at the same time, we have these really extreme hot days. So these are days last summer when it was sort of 40 degrees and plus really high temperatures um, in our enclosures um, and really high up and down temperatures because they're not very good at buffering um, extreme temperatures. We'll start seeing high amb ambient nutrients, potentially because of nutrient regeneration and things dying off. And this led to big algal blooms in all our enclosures at different times, um, which seems to be dominated by sparrow sisters. I haven't done the full outlook counts of this, this work. 
And these graphs show our planktonic chlorophyllae. So big jumps um, by, by two weeks into this experiment. Um, and slightly higher, again, in the treatment versus control. But big jumps, big blooms of algae. Um, and at the bottom is our bent peak chlorophyllae. So what we scrubbed off our little bits of wooden things. And again, sort of increasing chlorophyllae in, in all our enclosures. Um, and the higher the treatment by the end. Um, so not, not quite what we were trying to uh, manipulate in these experiments, but what's happened anyway. Um, how did this, yeah, and this, these two graphs just show you sort of what happened with temperature. It's a really strange conditions, right? So um, up, up to 30 degrees in our enclosures. And so the red is our um, treatments, the blues control. They don't really vary too much. Um, and this is temperature here on the left. Uh, and you can see like big changes in the diurnal temperature because of the buffering of these things. Uh, but yeah, big heat wave followed by big storm and crash temperatures drop to sort of 15 degrees uh, in the course of the day. At the same time, this is when we start seeing these blooms and the algae start happening. So really high is of oxygen happening um, at this time. This led to quite a, a, a sudden change in the zooplankton structure, um, quite a sort of regime change, regime change, regime change essentially. Um, high, uh, high levels of nopoli, high levels of rotifers, different types of rotifers, um, particularly splancha, which is a more predatory one, colorella, which is largely a more herbivorous one, attaches to the sides and kind of feeds and stuff, largely algae. Uh, and then huge amounts of podocera, which were barely there at the start of the experiment. Um, and sort of sitting there in the water column field of feeding on this algae. Um, and this translates to huge numbers of zooplankton in the second half of this experiment. Much higher um, numbers of norpoli um, in uh, treatment versus control. That's probably because we had higher numbers of adults growing in the first half of the experiment, um, but much higher numbers of, 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 of clodostra as well. And these are both in log scale, to give you some idea of just the huge amounts of zooplankton coming out of these experiments. Um, think about our fish. So it's hard to, we couldn't see any of these fish during the experiment. Um, eventually, we went out with light, light traps at the end. We got um, Dan and the, and the fish boys to help, help try and get these critters out. Um, and we even had some help potentially from a frog who kept jumping in there, um, probably trying to fish out some fish. We're not sure. Um, but for those who say we don't do experiments with frogs, we sort of did one. Um, <laughs> These are results from our fish. So there were differences, but these are very small differences. So on the left is our control, this is standard length, and the right is our treatment. So uh, this looks like a big difference, but uh, the sort of scale here uh, is relatively cropped. So these are very small differences, but differences are the same between the control and treatment for size and also weight. The fish are getting slightly heavier, slightly bigger in these treatments versus the control, but it's not too much. And I think draw conclusions is a little bit tricky because the huge amounts of, of, out, of sort of primary production happening probably masks the effect we're trying to manipulate with our treatment to some degree. There's potential further analysis we can do. So we kept the experiment going. We're not measuring everything um, for another four or five weeks. This is every fish that we sampled in the first four weeks there on the right, the sort of lengths on the x-axis and weights on the, on the y-axis. Um, and again, down there at week nine, the one below, the dark circles being the control, the light circles being the treatment. So you can see there is this sort of trend that continues for another four or five weeks of slightly bigger fish growing slightly more in, in the treatments. And this is what they sort of look like after nine weeks, really beautiful um, little fish. Um, but you know, where is this change occurring? Is this change occurring in the first sort of two weeks? when what we're manipulating is really working or is this change really happening? Mostly because of these huge algal blooms, which are a bit out of our control. Potential for further analysis, but we've got a lot more sort of discussion to do before we invest sort of in those sorts of results. Um, so to conclude this last part of the study, and this last study um, is the microbial loop. Well, yeah. um, how is the structure of what are the important parts of the food web structure when we get organic matter, matter pulses? We're again seeing these microbial loop component, components really important early on. So they're probably really important to represent when we're thinking about modeling food webs. It becomes less clear 
and do organic matter um, pulses support the growth of pyotrophic levels? Well, it seems like it for zooplankton early on in that experiment, but for fish, it's really less clear. Um, when we have isotope results that I haven't properly analyzed yet, but they don't look like they really help um, us answer those questions either. So sort of quickly conclude here, because I know it's um, about time. Um, how do these findings relate to flow management? So the second part of the work in this project that I'm really focusing on now is developing bioenergetic food web models um, that can help inform the management of environmental flows. So this is an example of some of this, the work we're coming up with, all these different um, sort of food web groups and how they're connected. Um, and so the results from these experiments can kind of help inform different parts of the model. So, um, you know, we can put in that during particular high flow times, organic matter might be more susceptible to um, being utilized by bacteria. You know, it's important to pretend to include um, types of groups like in the microbial loop in, this, in our food web models, um, as well as sort of different size structures of zooplankton and potentially mixotrophic algae. Um, and we can also start to, to look at um, sort of model, putting in sort of simple population models around larval, juvenile, and, and adult verbs to try and represent some of those important relationships that we're seeing in these experiments. That's how these results, I guess, fit into the sort of work that I'm doing now, thinking about developing these models where we can model different flow scenarios that can help inform the kinds of environmental flows that we might need and use to help support food web production in the basin. And so what's next? We're developing particular case studies um, of food webs, um, so river channels, thinking the Lachlan or maybe other systems, uh, and or a wetland channel. And we haven't really talked about wetlands here today, so I've got questions around that. I've mostly focused on river channels, I know. Um, but also developing models for, wet, for wetlands um, in the water. Um, and those sorts of things that we hope will output from that will sort of show us well, you know, potentially how you know, fish might change over time under different scenarios. Um, and as further experimental work that we will be doing um, this summer, thinking about the importance of the river height and wetting banks and benches um, in rivers to promote um, food web productivity. Uh, and we're looking for potentially uh, students um, or other people to, to work on this project. So if that's something you're interested in doing this sort of work or, or studies, you're finishing your honours or some, something, um, get in touch and there's some potentially interesting work that we can do around that. Um, so with that, I'll finish, it's 50 minutes. Um, lovely photo of, of Darren there um, at the end of our mesocosm experiments, admiring the view. Thanks to all um, of those lovely people who are contributing in different ways, particularly the Flomo Food Web. Um, group um, who we have lots of lovely chats with um, and a huge amount of other people um, at UC um, who've helped out in all sorts of different ways. So um, thank you very much. And then I've got a little bit of time for questions before um, it's lunch. So, um, yeah, <laughs> all right. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much, James. Uh, do we have any questions? I noticed one comment from Pete Unmack um, around the fact that small differences can make, small differences in food supply can make a big difference to fish um, in the chat. Any questions for anyone? Will. Cameron, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, great talk. Um, I suppose putting uh, the water manager's hat on, so thinking if I was an environmental water manager, I would say, how can we increase that bioavailability so that your first study, you show that there's a whole lot of carbon and, and nutrients that maybe aren't available and that these are the, the availability changes throughout the flow poles. If I had some water, would it be best for me to do maybe two small floods in close succession or one really big flood with a whole lot of dry period in between? Like the dry period or the... The, the, the length of the flood, these things obviously influence um, the way in which carbon breaks down. How should I use my water? Uh, good question. I'm not sure the answer um, off the top of my head. But I mean, I suppose, I mean, what came to mind immediately thinking about that, of course, is the flip side that if you, I mean, and actually I didn't put that graph up, but what happened during the peak of those big floods is oxygen went down to pretty much zero. So, um, you also don't want too much of these big loads of organic matter coming in and creating black water events as well, I guess. So 
Um, I don't know off the top of my head, thinking about the differences between sort of times between inundation and what's um, important. Um, I, I imagine it also relates to things like time to the year and it'd be very habitat specific, I guess. Um, so I think, you know, it's a very different results in wetlands, for example, versus um, rivers, uh, river banks. Um, and there'd also be a threshold at some point. So you'd sort of probably reach some threshold fairly early on um, where that sort of organic material coming in sort of reaches its peak, peak of usability. Um, but yeah, I think it would depend very much on where you are in, in the basin system. And particularly like if, if you're in talking about the Murray River, then those ideas around bioavailability um, are, are managed really closely to avoid black water. Whereas, you know, up in the Northern Basin and in other parts, um, there's less sort of less ability to do those sorts of things. Um, but I think, you know, I, I suppose thinking about flood regimes um, is potentially, I guess, an important question around are bigger floods better than those than a couple of smaller floods, I guess. And I think that would depend on whereabouts you are in the system and you know, your ability to create overbank flooding, which would have a whole bunch of other um, important effects that sort are of connecting habitats and those sorts of things. So, yeah, so not sure off the top of my head, I suppose is the answer. Yeah, no, sorry, it was a bit of a nasty question, but I think that's the kind of question that you might might get. <laughs> totally. Yep. <laughs> I, think it's, I, think it's a, I think it's a great question. And um, we have uh, now, I think it's the 26th of February next year is when we have the showcase for this project. and. Uh, lots of water managers, I'm sure, will be uh, popping up their hand to ask almost exactly the same question. What does it mean for me? How do I um, use my water assets in order to generate more uh, fish and birds? Um, so I think, you know, it's obviously we're part along part of the journey towards answering those questions. And I think we uh, have, obviously have our eye on them. I am aware that we're about to roll over to 12.30 and that um, James has very tidily programmed his talk so that he just exposed himself to an absolute minimum of questions. Um, that said, I'm uh, positive that he would be very pleased if you followed up with any further conversation or questions about his project in the future. Um, but for now, we will leave it there. Uh, thanks very much, James. Um, really, really fascinating stuff. Thanks to all of our guests and people from UC who are here today. And we will catch you for next week's seminar. Cheers, folks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, see ya.